yeah, you can come here, you can compete, right? But we have other guys on the roster too that are pretty good. Yeah, they were recruited there on scholarship for a reason, right? And that, that also shows, okay, how competitive the kid truly is and where is his self-confidence, right? If that kid says, okay, I'm coming in, I know I'm going to compete, and I got the highest self-confidence in myself, great. What's going on, guys? First and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning into Passion Changes Everything. Um, if you guys like what I'm wearing or you want to support a great cause, 100% of the proceeds go to um, the Ponto family. Their son Joey is dealing with some medical issues and they can really use our help. So I greatly appreciate that. Our guest today is the quarterback coach from Bryant. He's not only just the quarterback coach, but he's one of my great friends. I'm sure he'll share some crazy stories that we had he went to Hartwick as well so hopefully it's super super interesting to you guys I'll be asking him um questions like what does it take to be a d1 coach what do d1 coaches look for in players and all that kind of good stuff so let's welcome Tom Zadeski let's go oh he's not here yet hold on oh he's still not here come on Tom what are you doing buddy let's go my boy, when the camera turns on, I turn on, so I had to pick up the energy a little bit. But what's going on, brother? Not much, man. Well, first off, obviously appreciate you taking the time today to sit down with me and have me on your podcast. I know I'm not one of your first guests, but uh, really appreciate you doing this. I'm really excited for it. Let's go. All right, so we're going to start off with you telling me your story from the very beginning, whether it's Pop Warner days, that type of stuff. So the floor is yours. Holy crap. Okay. Where do I start? Well, obviously for me, you know, obviously I always loved sports, you know, growing up, uh, Rochester, New York from, from New York, but, uh, growing up playing sports, my, my dad was my coach for a lot of different things, but yeah, I played football. I played baseball, you know, anything, you know, really I, I could get my hands on at a young age is what I did. Um, but then I kind of grew at, grew up and loved football. I loved everything about it. Um, and I kind of, when I got to high school, I kind of decided, you know, I really want to be good at football. And so I really took the time uh, away from the sport uh, you know, in the off season as well to, to take my time and really become good at it, hone my skills and kind of figure out the nuances of you know, the, the position of quarterback. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know where that would take me, but obviously I got the opportunity to go play quarterback um, at a couple of different places in college. I bounced around a little bit, kind of like yourself, but uh, you know, I went to Stonehill. I was at Hobart for a little bit and I was at Hartwick where I finished my career. But uh, you know, after that, I kind of, I wanted to stay in football in some regard. I didn't know what capacity it would be. Um, so one of the first things I did once I graduated was kind of just sent out, you know, a blanket email to a million different college coaches kind of asking, hey, you know, can I come on staff? You know, can I just be around? And that was the biggest thing for me. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of letters back. Most of them saying, hey, you know, thanks, but no thanks. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, one of the few interesting ones that I got, I did get one from Cliff Kingsbury back when he was at Texas Tech. Now, I don't know if he actually wrote it. <laughs> you know, I have to say it's probably his secretary that wrote it, but um, so, yeah. he sent me one saying, hey, you know, best of luck to you. We don't have anything at the moment. Um, Bill Snyder was another one, head coach over at Kansas State. And then uh, one of the other ones I got was Ron Whitcomb, who's a quarterback coach at Old Dominion, reached out to me. And it's actually funny because he's – he grew up about – probably about 45 minutes from where I did, you know, opposite side of Rochester. But, uh, you yeah, know, he reached out to me and said, hey, if you want to come on, on staff, you know, be my guest. We'd love to have you. Uh, so I went down there as a quality control coach, you know, working with the quarterbacks. I uh, was down there for about probably six, seven months. And then uh, from there, I got a call from one of my buddies. Because even when I was in college, I, I was kind of knew that I wanted to stay with football. I wanted to coach. Um, so, you know, in our, whether it was J term or uh, spring break or uh, summer uh, break, you know, I'd kind of go to a bunch of different colleges and kind of volunteer my time at camps. Because I knew I wanted to coach. I knew, you know, obviously, coaching is a, a relationship built business. So the more people that you know, the easier it is for you after college to get a job. Absolutely. No, no, no doubt. But, um, you know, when I was doing that, I went down to Wagner University um, where I worked with uh, Steve Siasi mostly, who's actually now he's our offensive line coach here at Bryant. He's hey, been one of my connections. Him, and, uh, yeah, he was at um, – he went down to FIU, and he gave me a call said that they had a position working with the offensive line. And at the time, to tell you the truth, I knew absolutely nothing about offensive line. Uh, you know, I played quarterback my entire life. You know, I, I knew, okay, this is how the scheme's supposed to work. I didn't know how the technique aspect of doing it. You knew more than me. Uh, I don't know anything. anything. But uh, going down there, um, 
I basically told him, who was the, the offensive line GA, and their offensive line coach, Alan Bogridge, I was like, listen, you know, I don't know nothing uh, about offensive line play, but, you know, I'll be here, you know, sun up to sundown. I'll do whatever you guys need me to do. And, you know, both of them really took me under the wing and, and showed me the ropes of not only college football, but um, offensive line play, which I think is huge, especially, you know, moving throughout your career. That's something that you have to learn. Um, but then just being down there, you know, I had the opportunity to be in the room with uh, Rich Skrosky, who was our offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach. Um, Alan Mowrich was the offensive line coach. Um, Ken Dorsey, who was uh, associate AD at the time, now he's the uh, Buffalo Bills quarterback coach. Ironically, nice. yeah, um, networking, networking, networking. Yes. And to just be in the room with those guys alone, you know, aside from the networking aspect of it, which is pretty obvious, but um, being in the room with those guys every single day, just hearing those guys talk ball, just completely accelerated, you know, my young career. And then obviously. Um, it's actually a funny story because when I was at FRU, we obviously had a tremendous year. You know, we, we were one win away uh, from going to the conference championship. We ended up losing to Marshall. We needed to beat them. We were going. Uh, but we still ended up playing um, in the Bahamas Bowl, which is like I didn't realize how close it was to Miami. It's literally a hop, skip, and a jump away. You get on a flight, it's like a half an hour, and then you're there. Um, really? No, we went down there for, for the week, for the full week. We stayed at the, the – I forget the name of the, the resort that's down there. Um, but we stayed there for the full week, one of the greatest experiences, you know, in my own career I, I've had the pleasure of doing. Um, but when I was down there, I worked at camp through uh, USA football. And the guy who actually was in charge of it was Chris Merritt, who's currently our head coach here at Bryant. And so ironically, like weeks later, you know, we, we I met him probably mid-December. And then weeks later, he gets the job up here at Bryant. And he knew that I wanted to get back to the Northeast. You know, my family's up here. Um, so he called me and he said, hey, uh, I got a job as a running backs coach. You want to come up here, Brian? I was like, I don't know nothing about running backs, but let's do it. Oh, boy, do I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, absolutely, let's do this thing. And then, you know, it wasn't too long after, probably about a month or two into it, when we just started spring ball, you know, at the time. You know, he asked me, hey, you know, why don't you coach quarterbacks? I said, say less. You know, that, that's <laughs> to me, I was like, you know, at quarter, coaching quarterbacks was my dream at the time. That's always what I wanted to do, especially at the high level. Um, but to be able to do that was just unbelievable opportunity that he afforded me and, and been here ever since. And I've got some great guys on the roster, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, you know, once these guys get back to campus, you know, we lost them right before we were supposed to start spring ball. You know, they went away for spring break, and then, boom, COVID hits. And, you know, at first it was originally supposed to be two weeks, and then we're back to normal, right? And then uh, two weeks turned into four weeks, which turned into four months, which here we are now. Yeah. Um, but uh, – no, I've been here ever since, and I absolutely love it. And, you know, we're going in year two as a staff together, but uh, really looking forward to whatever we can do next. Let's go. All right, so based off what you said about COVID, what kind of precautions are you guys taking at Bryant? Oh, God. Um, one of the first things, you know, Bryant University invested $3 million in testing you know, students, faculty, and staff on a weekly basis, and that's one of the first things that we're doing. Um, I believe all kids report back. I think it's a freshman report back the 17th. And then uh, I think it's upperclassmen report back the following days. But, uh, you know, those guys are going to be tested weekly. Um, and then they're, they're tied into, I think it's Harvard and MIT up there, where they're sending the results or they're sending the tests to them. They're doing the results, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they're supposed to get that back within 24 hours. So we'll know, hey, if anybody has COVID. And they set up a single it's a Cumberland dorm. So we have a full dorm that if anybody tests positive for COVID, they stay there, uh, basically, in, in self-isolation. But, uh, you know, to tell the truth, if they, if they weren't really – taking the time to uh, test kids on a weekly basis. I don't know if I'd feel comfortable going back there, but, uh, you know, them doing that, I think for, we're fortunate to have the ability to do it, but it's, it's a huge thing that I think is really important for us moving forward until, you know, we kind of get this COVID deal pushed behind us. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, it helps 100%. 100%. Now, is it that test that they put up your nose and it touches your brain and tickles it a little bit? No. Easier. So I guess I guess it's it's a new one that they're telling me about because I asked the same question. That was my first question. They're putting that thing down my nose on a weekly basis. I'm like, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. But uh, no, I guess it's one where they kind of scrape like the inside. It's not it's not as far, but it's kind of close. But I guess what they're telling us is, oh, it's, it's not as bad. You know, kind of tickles just a little bit. But uh, no, it's not too bad at least. <laughs> That's manageable. Nobody's touching my brain. Absolutely. All right. So bringing you back because I heard I heard a couple of rumors about you. When you grew oh, up. God, let me hear it. Some people think that you might have been a better baseball player. 
that yeah, year. without a doubt, I probably was. You know, out of, out of high school, I had my uh, only one real Division One offer was to uh, Niagara University as a baseball player. But you know, like I said to you, you know, growing up, I played a bunch of different sports. Uh, but at an early age, I kind of fell in love with the sport of football. And, you know, for me, that was always what I wanted to do. And it didn't really matter. You know, obviously, I wanted to play at the highest level. I think that was without a question. But, you know, I just wanted to go somewhere, you know, kind of get a little portion of my college degree paid for it because of how athletically, you know, I was gifted. Absolutely. Um, but then to be able to play in college, I think anywhere I, I would have been good with. Oh, 100%. So what, what's some advice you would have? Because I was a kid that um, I could have played – I could have ran track. I didn't. I sure. played basketball as a freshman, freshman, maybe eighth grade. And I'm pretty athletic, obviously. I could play sure. basketball, but I, I gave that up as a freshman. What is some advice that you have for people that play multiple sports? Like, how did you, got, how did you go from baseball to only focusing on football? Do you recommend kids play multiple sports? And how does that affect recruiting as well? You know, I definitely think, you know, in today's day and age, more and more kids are trying to become more specified in a particular sport. Um, for whatever reason that may be, because, you know, at an early age, I knew that I loved football and that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I think a lot of kids are like that in the same regard. But, uh, you know, I love kids that also play multiple sports. You know, that was something I did. I, you know, I wrestled, I, I played baseball, and I played football. And uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we got to grow as a young athlete is your competitiveness. And the only way that you can do that is by playing multiple sports year round. Because it's one thing to go out there, you know, in your off season of football and sling the rock around, but it's not thing to go out there and compete against somebody, which I think, you know, that competitiveness, that's, that's one of the first things, you know, as a college recruiter that I look for is how competitive is this kid? Cause I, I think it's no, no secret that Tom Brady is the way he is. Cause he's the most competitive, oh, competitive guy on the field without question. Yeah. So going off of that competitiveness, how can you, I guess, um, find out how competitive someone is, without actually seeing them on the field? Like, how does your recruiting go based on high school kids if they send you, like, film? And what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Because they can send you um, an email. They can call you. They can send messages on Twitter or whatever. Sure. What's sure. the best way? Well, I will say right now, for me, probably the best way is social media. I think uh, that, that's really what Twitter, to tell you the truth, has turned into a lot of college recruiting. That's really the, the biggest thing. You know, people still send emails, and I'll get back to you if you send me an email. But uh, – Twitter is definitely the first one. It's, it's easily accessible, too. Uh, you know, as soon as I get a DM from a kid, and I, I mean, I get a ton of them every day long. I probably got a couple thousand followers at this point. But, you know, those guys, you know, sending through DMs and, you know, keeping in contact with these kids because it, it is a relationship built business to begin with. And, and building that relationship with these kids, I think, is huge. But, uh, yeah. So social media. All right. So does it get to a point where if I send you um, my film on Twitter, say, and you don't get back to me, would you prefer that kid to keep like showing effort and sending it again? Or would you rather be like, does it get to a point where it's like annoying? Like, okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, certainly if it was me to tell the truth, I'd keep sending it. I, I have no problem with the kid doing that. Cause if it's your dream to play at Bryant university, keep sending me those things. Do your thing. Dog. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shoot you down for that. And uh, you know, regardless of how talented you may be, you know, if you want to come to Bryant university, I'm going to try to get back to you as fast as I possibly can. You know, I don't, obviously have the ability to do that all the time. If, if, if that was the case, I'd probably be on Twitter 24-7. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah, you know, if a kid DMs me, I'll try to get back to him right away. And, obviously, there's sometimes I might not see it because, like I said, I'm getting flooded on a daily basis. But, uh, you know, once I get back to one of those kids, especially if, if he's a talented player, and regardless, you know, if we take walk-ons too. If you want to come to Bryant University and, and be a part of something special, we'd love to have you because of how truly talented you are. Oh, absolutely. I love that. Now, what kind of things would you want them – if you had to pick the perfect thing to send in Twitter, um, what would it be? Like bio, highlight film, GPA, sure. that type of stuff? What package would you want to be the perfect? Sure. Well, definitely. I think – I mean, I think you hit the, the big ones there. You know, obviously film has to be attached. I think that's a big thing, your name. And then obviously uh, your year because, you know, there's, there's some instances where, you know, especially due to the NCAA rules, I'm not allowed to talk to kids uh, – before you know they hit a certain age right um but yeah if you're a junior going into your senior year i can talk to you you're 2021 20, uh for us right now it's, it's easy for us to talk to them but then the other thing obviously would be gpa and then even if you have transcripts uh readily available i think that's a, that's a big thing especially to tell you sure that's more kind of dependent upon what university you're at um, but here at bryant you know obviously we need to get kids with certain uh, academic standards uh, that can come into school because we can't just have anybody because this is a high academic institution absolutely 
All right, so going off of the academics, because as a person who struggled with academics growing up, I wondered, um, and feel free if you can't answer any of these questions, just be like, oh, let me get back to you on it. No, I got you. I got you. I always wondered where, like, if you think about um, Florida State players when that article came out and that they can't read, and it's like a common theme, how much does your, is there a minimum GPA that you cannot accept? And how much does, if he's the next Reggie Bush, play into it? You know sure, I mean? sure. Absolutely. Well, I will say, too, for us, you know, you're over that four-year span. I think a lot of kids, especially when they're freshmen in high school, you're, you're immature, right? I think, you know, I made mistakes as a freshman in high school, as a sophomore in high school. Everybody does. So if you show, regardless of your GPA, that you're steadily, you know, improving your, your academics from freshman to senior year, uh, I, that's 100% something that we'll take into consideration. And then there is academic standards for us to begin with. Um, but again, if he's, if he's right around that 3-0 mark, then we are SAT optional at Bryant. Um, if he's right around that 3-0 mark, we can kind of get him in school. But if he's well below that and he's kind of a real, not a great student uh, and doesn't take school seriously, that is definitely something that we take into account and study the truth. Regardless of how good they are or aren't, um, we'd probably only take a couple of those type of kids each class. And then for that as well, because you also have to consider each school has academic resources to kind of built into it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to spend all our resources on one kid. And I know that kind of sounds, uh, you know what I mean, but it's, it sounds bad for, for one kid, but, you know, we want to spread that out throughout our, our, our entire uh, student body, right? Um, but I think that's important for them to be around that 3-0 mark, especially, you know, guys at the quarterback position, the ones that I'm recruiting. Yeah. We got a lot of things that we do within our offense. If you're not a strong student, I'm a little bit more worried about you now. Yeah. I need you to be have, have a high football IQ. And I think, you know, that GPA really shows not necessarily how smart you are, um, but your work ethic. Awesome. And then also your SAT score kind of shows me, okay, what's his ceiling? That's really what it is for me. Gotcha. No, I love that. That's a great answer. I really appreciate that, that answer. Absolutely. Um, going off of that. Let's say you have a kid that's, I would say Reggie Bush, because that's the greatest college football player of all times. No cap. You have a Reggie Bush type of guy who has a great attitude. He's not that intelligent. Um, what's your advice to him based on, like, the JUCO route? Like, how do you feel about junior colleges or prep schools and stuff like that? Well, I do think everybody has a different path, you know, within their recruiting process, and it is different for everybody. Uh, one of the things I will say is stay true to your process, and if you want to play Division One football, do everything in your power. I mean, the, the title of your podcast is what? Passion changes everything? Absolutely. Absolutely. If your passion is to go play uh, Division One football, chase that passion. Don't let anybody ever tell you different. You know, I had a lot of coaches at a young age. You know, I kind of grew up before I grew out. So I was about six foot five in eighth grade, all hands and feet. Oh, right? yeah. I'm trying to throw, uh, throw a rock back there. <laughs> and I wasn't very good at it. And I had some coaches come to me and say, hey, well, why don't you try a different sport? And I was like, nah, I mean, football is what I love. Yeah. And you know, fortunately, you know, I started to mature a little bit. And then, by the time I was a junior, I became pretty good at the sport. And, but I just kept chasing it, regardless of what anybody told me. And, you know, I think that's a, the, one of the better things for, for you to find within an athlete is what's their inner drive. You know, those JUCO kids, they love football. You have to, or you will not. Otherwise, you're not going to make it 100%, right? Uh, so I do think that's important. But, um, yeah, like I said, if that's your passion, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I love that. I love that. All right. So going off of what you said, say how tall you are one more time. We call I am currently, I, last time I was at the doctor, I think I was six foot four and three quarters. Sheesh. All right. So yeah, going off of that, that, do you guys have like a prototypical size that you want for every position? Like I know how some coaches that like Rutgers one year only wanted six, four receivers. You know what I mean? Sure. sure. You guys have like a, and then of course you're going to vary. Of course, if Tavon Austin mm -hmm. comes to your school, He's, Without question. Yeah. Without question. But do you have like a target goal and does it change based on years? Does that make sense? Yeah. And this was actually something, you know, I kind of had the same question for uh, our quarterback coach when I was at Old Dominion. Because um, obviously I, I kind of worked hand in hand with him and recruiting him and kind of what he liked and what he was looking for. So we kind of had to be on the same page a lot of times. Um, but one of the things he said to me was, you know, obviously we want, okay, if, I'm, if I have a six foot four guy, who has all these intangibles, and I have a five foot ten guy who has the same exact intangibles. Of course, I'm going to take the six foot four guy. Absolutely, right? but they have to be uh, exactly the same in every other regard. regard right? But the shorter he is, uh, the one thing that you know he said and it's always stuck with me is the more electric they have to be. You know, they have to be a difference maker uh, every single play on the field. 
Um, and I don't think necessarily that, you know, you're seeing more and more guys now within the NFL. I mean, Kyler Murray, who was rookie of the year last year, he's what, five foot nine and three quarters? Hey, hey, um, he measured in. He measured in a little taller. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's feeling pretty limber that day. But, yeah. Uh, I think they boosted him a little bit. Absolutely. But then even other guys like Russell Wilson and Drew Brees. But to me, if you can ball, you can ball. Absolutely. You know, we've offered some quarterbacks here that, you know, we're under the six-foot mark, and we've offered ones that are six-foot five. Um, it doesn't matter so much to me. You know, one of the things, you know, obviously checking the tape is one thing. But then obviously the, the other part that we have to really dive into is, you know, the character. You know, what is the kid's character and how is he off the field? You know, what would uh, the janitor at the, at the school say about him? I love that. I love that. Um, so a question that I personally have that I've always wanted to know. Is, um, based off scholarships, I don't know if you want to give like a brief summary of the kind of scholarships that you guys offer. Um, but more specifically, what is a preferred walk-on? And is there such thing as a non-preferred walk-on? Because that would be rude to tell someone. Like, Sure, 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 sure. Uh, to tell you the truth, you know, the, the walk-ons that we take here at Bryant, they're all preferred walk-ons. They're, they're kind of slightly recruited. You know, obviously they don't, they don't have a scholarship that's really involved uh, from an athletic standpoint. Um, but then walk-ons, you know, typically if you're just a walk-on, maybe you come to Bryant and then you, maybe your second year you're like, oh, I played football in high school. I kind of want to play football again. Um, then you just come, you know, we have a tryout typically in the spring and that kid would try out. And if we deemed he was good enough and, and his character kind of checked what we were looking for, 100% we'll take him. I love that. But, uh, you know, all of the kids that we recruit out of high school and they come to, to Bryant, not necessarily on scholarship, they're all preferred walk guys. I love that. I love that. Now, um, what's your take? Or do you, I, I don't want to say this the wrong way to where you're like, oh, I don't know. So you don't have to speak for, from Brian's perspective um, necessarily, but what's your take on the idea that there's certain kids that get brought in to boost the team GPA? I got you. Yeah, and I, I mean, to tell you the truth, I don't think – I've never looked at a kid and said, I'm just bringing him in to boost the team's GPA. Um, I don't think anybody at Bryant would do that. And, I, and, you know, in my short tenure as a coach, whether it was at Old Dominion or at FIU, you know, I never was really part of a program where that was really a big thing. We were bringing in kids just to boost the team's GPA, you know. Obviously, that's important, but if you're recruiting the right kids to begin with, you know, the ones that are working hard, and you know, that goes back to, you know, checking everything across the board for, you know, the kids that we offer scholarships to. Um, if they check those boxes, then, then yeah, well, we shouldn't really have an issue with them off the field to begin with once they get here. Absolutely. Um, so do you guys offer full-ride scholarships, partial ride? Is it like – um you, a full ride is a full ride is that does that include like books and does sure. it vary or is sure. it 100 percent it 100 percent varies like if you look at those fbs schools you know they offer 100 percent full scholarships yeah it's all athletic aid and it pays for everything from books tuition room and board you name it mm -hmm. um now across the fcs level it's slightly different depending upon which conference you kind of look at now here in the nec you know we do we can kind of pair it together um, so how it works is we can give athletic aid and then we can give academic or financial. And then kind of how that's paired together, we can take either that academic and financial and then pair it with athletic and we can still get him to zero. So we still have that ability, but then he would have to pay for like, you know, his housing deposit and then pay for books. But then in terms of everything else, in terms of tuition, room and board um, and meals and all that, he's good to go. But it does differ depending upon uh, what conference you're really in. Uh, and even schools uh, tend to vary as well. And it's all kind of divvied up. Like, you kind of look at it from an athletic perspective. It's more of a pool of money, to tell you the truth, than it really is. Like, I have a one scholarship. Now, you have to disperse it among uh, a certain number of players. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, but it's really just a, a giant pool of money that you say, okay, I want to divvy this up across however many. And that goes back to, okay, the kids with higher GPAs, the ones that have good SAT scores, they're going to get an academic scholarship from the school. So then, okay, we have uh, – it's a cheaper athletic scholarship now for us to give him. So now we have more money potentially to give to somebody else. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. But so yeah, like, it's, it's kind of different uh, on a school-to-school -school basis and then also from conference to conference. Okay, 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 I hear you. So let's yeah. say you offered a scholarship to a kid, whether it was half academic, half – let's just say it's a full ride just to be easy. You sure. offer it to him his um, senior year, and then he gets hurt. Sure. What the scholarship uh to tell you the truth i mean for for us here at bryant i don't think and that really goes back to your head coach and his philosophy yeah uh, our head coach would never take away somebody's scholarship at that point now if that is a career-ending injury and he's saying okay i can't play for the next four years 
Um, but I'm still going to come to Bryant. We're going to honor that scholarship. Now we might have him involved in the program in other ways, uh, like maybe, I don't know, doing film and stuff along those lines, but uh, kind of become more like a student assistant, but also, again, honoring that scholarship that, you know, we've had guys before who, you know, got hurt kind of halfway through their career and couldn't really play. Uh, we still, again, honor their scholarship. And, and it goes back to team to team and coach to coach. If your head coach, you know, if he's a good man, and I, to tell you the truth, I don't know if I'd really want to work for a coach who, who thought the opposite. Oh, of course. Um, thousand percent. But, uh, we're fortunate here at, at Brian. You know, Coach Merritt does a tremendous job. You know, he was a high school coach for 18 years down there in Miami. So, you know, he would never want that to happen to one of his kids, you know, when he was in high school as a high school coach. So, you know, you can never do that to a kid now. Oh, thousand percent. I love that. Um, so what age in high school should people start trying to get connected with um, – coaches whether it's d3 d2 d1 you guys start looking at sophomores at freshmen you still have a shot when you're a senior and you just had a good senior year like what absolutely you know? yeah yeah so i would say uh the big thing for for you to start uh i think it's always important if you want to go to camps at a young age whether that's eighth grade ninth grade tenth grade go ahead and do it i think that's a great thing because you're going to be around college coaches who, who know a lot about the game and you'll always be able to pick up something from them and kind of attribute to your own throughout at your growth as a, as a young player but then you know for the recruiting process, the big year is obviously, you know, junior year going into senior year. Okay. Um, I think for those guys, you know, to get active on social media and then reach out to these coaches, send the film, the same stuff that we were talking about previously is really, really important. But then there are also our guys that are on our board um, as seniors that, okay, that I really like this kid. Maybe he played four games as a junior. Uh, he didn't start initially, but okay, he ended up playing the last four and he played really, really well. Okay, I'm looking at his tape. If he plays well his senior year, he could be a potential scholarship player. And that's kind of, you know, our grading system of how we evaluate players. You know, we have, okay, is he an offer now or is he a, a senior eval kid? If he passes that as a senior and that might be week three of his senior year, go ahead. He's an offer type player. Oh, I love that. I love that. Absolutely. Um, so going back to what you said about camps, did you personally go to any camps? And how oh, do you yeah. think that helped you out personally? Yeah, I mean, I went to a ton of, as a – you know, high school kid. And fortunately, my parents were parking me across the country, going to a bunch of different ones. And I, I had a lot of fun doing it. But uh, yeah, going to all those different camps and specifically with the quarterback position, I think there's a lot of different things that are taught. Um, so you can kind of take things away from each coach um, that they kind of try to teach him within drills, whatever it may be. And then when you go back home, you know, whether however long that camp was, whether it was a one day or two day or three day thing, you kind of keep going through those drills and kind of keep progressing as a young player. But, yeah, I definitely think that's super important. And, you know, one of the ones that I went to as, as a young player was uh, the Manning Passing Academy, which if you're any quarterback out there, I highly, highly recommend going to that. It's one of the best camps in the country. The Mannings have put on for however many years now, and they've had tremendous uh, college players essentially be your counselors there for you too. Like when I went, um, one of our counselors was Jordan Jefferson, LSU, um, Andrew Luck, who right before he was still with Stanford, he was about to graduate. and yeah, he was one of them. <laughs> um, Brian Bennett, who was at Oregon at the time, a um, bunch of different guys. And, you know, the Mannings come around uh, each and every day and they kind of talk you through some drills and whatnot. John Gruden was there. I was actually in the same drills with Gruden's son, Deuce Gruden. Um, but, yeah, that was one of the best camps. I went to it two years in a row. And it was a tremendous opportunity, and I had a lot of fun doing it. Where's that one located? Thibodeau, Louisiana at Nichols State University, I believe. Oh, they're from Louisiana, right? Them and Odell, yeah. right? Isn't that uh, and somewhere maybe. out there? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Something like that. Um, what do you, what's your thoughts on people trying to transfer? Because you know, guys like me and you, I was always looking like I'm trying to upgrade, upgrade. Anyway, um, sure. what are kind of the rules that you have to follow when if you're a transfer player before sure. directing or before getting in contact with a coach, and then how does the coach? kind of evaluate that? Well, there's all sorts of different, it's kind of dependent upon what level you're coming from. So it's all different in terms of the, the process that you kind of have to go through. But, you know, typically, obviously, excuse me, you got to get into the transfer portal and then, uh, you know, reach out to a bunch of different coaches, but you basically got to get a waiver essentially. I'm saying that you are in the transfer portal. Um, otherwise we can't really talk to you prior to that. But uh, yeah, typically to tell you the truth, I think, Transfers are good. There's a place for them in all college football. But, you know, I, one of the things that as a coach I, I want, you know, especially that goes back to our evaluating of high school kids, is I want a kid, again, who wants to come to Bryant for the right reasons. 
who wants to be at Bryan for the full four years and really loves the place and doesn't come because of the coaching staff. You know, I'm not going to be the one that keeps him there. It's going to be the school that keeps him there. I think that's a big thing, you know, in, in the evaluation process of understanding, okay, what's important to him and, and what, what does he want out of his next four to five years? And then obviously your college is going to be, you know, it's not a four-year decision, it's a 40-year decision. So it's really important as well. But, uh, you know, we've taken a couple of transfers and they've been some really good players for us. But at the same time, we want our young bucks to, you know, kind of bloom where you're planted, right? Absolutely. You know what I mean? And can kind of mold them to your system a little bit, you know? One hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, do you do you guys look at people's social media accounts? Like, if there's a player that you are really interested, he sends you the right stuff. He looks great. Do you view their Instagram, their tw- their Twitter, Facebook, whatever? Absolutely, without question. It's one of the first things that we do when we're kind of vetting a kid, and we decide, you know, going through again that evaluation process. Of, okay, we're looking at his film. Okay, he's he's got the film, right? Okay, we're looking at his academics. He's got the academics, and okay. And then it goes to the character, right? So we, one of the things that we do is obviously we go through all of his social media. Twitter is obviously the big one. And then obviously talking to his coach as well. I think that's a big thing. And, and you, know, you, you really have to build a relationship with the coach because I do believe that some will kind of BS you a little bit uh, and tell me what you want to hear. But at the same time, if you have a good relationship with, with the coach at, at that high school, he's not going to lie to you. And uh, I've had some really good ones, you know, who have told me the truth. Hey, coach, you know, he's a trans ball player, but he's an knucklehead off the field. You know, and, and I think that's important for, for, you know, recruits to also have that conversation. Understand your coach is going to be your, your number one ticket out of your, out, out of here, right? Thousands. So if you're not doing the right things that you need to in high school, uh, you know, he's obviously going to be the one that tells you otherwise. Got you. So what type of things kind of, um, what are knocks that you should not have on your Instagram or your Twitter? What are so, just some things? Um, obviously, you don't want to be drinking underage, smoking. What are some other things? <laughs> Well, you know, my uh, kind of my rule that I give our guys is, you know, if it's not something that your mom would want to see on social media, it's probably not a good idea for you to post it. Gotcha. Um, and that even for anybody, you know, whether it is our guys at, at Bryant right now when they're going to get a job, you know, four years after the, you know, they're done playing, um, that's still something that these uh, job recruiters look for. It's not just something that I'm looking for as a, as a football recruiter. Um, so it, it's important for, you know, we educate our guys on that process and the do's and don'ts. But, you know, my – Number one rule, I think it's a pretty simple rule. If your mom wouldn't want to see it, don't you post that thing on there. <laughs> I love that. I know Facebook's one thing. You're going to – that's where all the family and stuff is. Then you get on oh. Twitter, some Instagram. I might yeah. – I'll tell you what. No, a thousand percent. Different world. Yeah, no, and going off of Twitter also, um, how – I know Brian is kind of a small – how are you connected with um, – different professional football teams like IFL, um, CFL, XFL now, NFL, stuff like that. Because personally, I know professional coaches, they're crazy on Twitter. Um, sure. They'll reach out to you on Twitter. They'll, they'll reach out to you first sometimes if you post something, especially with arena, like lower levels. So um, how connected are you guys with professional teams? Mm-hmm. Um, going off that, like um, – I don't know how I want to phrase this question. What kind of things do you I want to phrase it wrong? So, cause the way I think of it is like a professional team is just like you guys to high school kids, you know, that's the goal from high school to talk to you guys. Do you think sure. it's the same for you guys to talk to professional teams? Sure. When, you, when they come in to meet with you, you're like, um, this guy, he is, GPA is this, 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 this type of kid is the exact same kind of conversation that you have. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we have a pro liaison on our staff. Our, our DFO and running backs coach is also our pro liaison, Ben McKaig. Uh, he does a tremendous job, but basically all the NFL scouts, um, they reach out to him uh, basically for a prospect list very early on before kind of that senior year approaches for these college kids. Um, and then essentially once you know the senior year is over, then you got obviously your pro day which uh, for any kid who has a great uh, you know, senior year, you know, obviously they'll go on a pro day. We actually host our pro day at Bryant. Uh, so all the Rhode Island schools come out to us. Uh, we do it because we have tremendous facilities. But, um, you know, so those uh, NFL coaches will come to us. Like two years ago, obviously we didn't have a pro day this past season because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, but two years ago we had uh, a pro day at Bryant, and we had a receiver, Tom Kennedy, who um, he did he, – he knocked it out of the park. Um, you know, he did the, the five ten five, yeah. and, uh, you know, he beat all the numbers at the combine. So, and it got 
to where the NFL scout was like, he did, he made him run it twice. And he's like, yeah, let's run it one more time. <laughs> yeah. Did yeah. And did, did you're doing something here. special. When they say, come here, run yeah, that. Yeah. And then uh, he's, he's signed, he signed with the Detroit Lions. He's currently on the active roster. So he's, he's done a tremendous job for himself. But uh, even after that, you know, the pro scout that's there that kind of runs your pro day. You know, they'll take the numbers and they'll share it with the rest of the NFL and they'll share it with the IFL and all those different leagues out there. Um, then, obviously, once those NFL scouts really like a player, uh, one of the things that they'll also do is obviously talk to the coach on staff that's kind of his position coach and the head coach and the offense coordinator. You know, what are your thoughts on him? And then, uh, you know, that can really shut the door on some kids and it can open it up for a lot of kids as well. Uh, obviously, TK for us was a tremendous ball player and nobody could say one bad thing about him. Um, so it was it was a no brainer for him to to get an opportunity like that. Shout out to that man! Congratulations! <laughs> Shout out to that guy. Um, who are your biggest? What's your who's your biggest inspiration or motivational people? Oh God! Mm. Well, definitely my mom, and my dad. I mean, I think you know my work ethic really comes from them. You know, those are two of the hardest working people I ever met in my life. And uh, beautiful people, beautiful people. Absolutely, you gotta <laughs> love, you gotta love mom and pop. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, from a young age, they kind of showed me right from wrong and uh, how to be professional. And, you know, they always work their tail off. My mom's a financial advisor, but, uh, you know, in her industry, you know, there's not a lot of women that do that job. So she was always kind of looked at differently. Um, but, yeah, that always kind of stuck with me. And I think, you know, she's, again, probably one of the top influences in my life, both the parents. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Now, um, that's a that's a fantastic answer. You make me tear up a little bit. That's beautiful. Yeah, you and me both. I'm thinking about it like, oh god. Because <laughs> this is this. I want this to be your opportunity to really say thank you to them. You know what I mean? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Right here, this is not this is not a crazy big podcast, but it could be. It could be. Hey, maybe one day. Never say never, baby. <laughs> never say never. I love that. Um, who are people that you look up to that are not um, like uh, celebrities or sure the best coaches or whatever? Who are those? Some of those people. Well, definitely as a player, I think the first one was Peyton Manning, without a doubt. You know, I loved everything that he did, and then Tom Brady as well. You know, both those guys. Um, as at the quarterback position, oh God, what do we got going on here? We got some picture. Another guy. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Odell. Yeah, yeah, baby. Well, you had the little Odell hair back in the day too. You really could pull it off. I was a follower. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for me as a player, it was Tom Brady and, and Peyton Manning, especially. You know, I was that tall guy that wasn't super athletic, but I could sling the rock. And so that was something that, you know, I took from them and really tried to, you know, attribute to my own game. But uh, in the coaching world now, I mean, there's a ton of guys that I look up to. Uh, obviously, I think the first one that pops to mind is uh, Lincoln Riley. I love what he does offensively. And uh, Sean Payton as well, those, those top-tier guys. But then there's also, you know, the ones that I got an opportunity to be around, you know, learning from them, whether it was Ron Wickham, Chris Malone, Al Mogridge, uh, Rich Skrowski, Ken Dorsey, Bryn Renner. Drew Davis, Butch Davis, the list goes on. I mean, those those guys, like oh, I said, those guys, crazy. <laughs> yeah, they really took me under the wing when I, when I was a young buck, and, uh, and I still am a young buck. But uh, you know, showed me the ropes of college football and showed me the ins and outs of it. And you know, I can't be, I can't thank them all enough. I love that. So, um, speaking of young bucks, how old are you? I'm actually, I'm only 25. This man is a baby. 25 remember, years old. I remember when I was 25. A couple months ago, that was a long time. Um, I got a couple more months. I'm hitting 26. I don't know. After 21, dude, it all goes downhill from there. I tell you what. Yeah, I know. A thousand, a thousand million. There's nothing to look forward to. There's yeah, absolutely. I'm like, oh, I got another birthday coming up. I oh, forget it. Whatever. I start lying about my age. That's how I knew I was getting up there. Like, yeah, no, I'm gonna be 22 uh, <laughs> in three years. Um, yeah. What's some advice that you have for kids that are being under recruited? Kids that are being under recruited. Hmm. One, trust the process. Um, it's kind of in the, in the college football recruiting world, it's kind of like the domino effect. You know, you think about all those top-tier recruits, you know, the five-star kids, you know, they pretty much at this point kind of have their schools picked out right, that they're committed to and they're, they're going to. But, um, you know, once those kids kind of pick their schools, then it's next-year kids, next-year kids, next-year kids, all the way down the ladder. And uh, just stick with it because, you know, there was kids that we came across in December. We said this kid's a scholarship player, you know, right before signing day. We're like, you know, let's go after him. And so we did that. But um, there's also kids that we were on in the early uh, part of the process, and you know they ended up committing to us. But um, but yeah, I would say just trust it and then keep working. And then if you're really truly being under recruited, um, don't ever doubt yourself. But 
you know, I, I would say the only reason you're really getting undercruited these days is because you're not on social media. And if you're not on social media, I think that's a big thing for, for you to get yourself out there. Oh, absolutely. What's yeah. some advice that you would give to people that want to get into coaching? Oh, man. Get into coaching. Well, one, you got to have a passion for it. You know, I think, you know, for me, at a point in time when I was at FIU, I was working 140 hours a week. I was hardly sleeping. Uh, yeah, it's something crazy. But, uh, you know, I'd sleep at the office. Uh, they had a little futon there for me. And, but uh, you really have to love it. I think that's the first thing. Like you're saying, passion changes everything, baby, right? But uh, got to love it. Stick to it. You know, it's a relationship-built business. Um, so the more guys that you can get yourself around, whether that's through working somewhere, clinic talking, just reaching out to somebody on, on social media, whatever it may be, um, I think it's huge. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Um, what's the craziest thing to ever happen to you um, on your journey to being a coach? Whether it's someone saying, absolutely not, I would never hire you or anything like that. The craziest thing on your journey. Craziest thing that's ever happened to me. Well, I know I already told you the story about getting a couple of letters back for some big name guys in, in college football, Cliff Kingsbury and Bill Snyder. That was pretty crazy. Um, I think the Bahamas Bowl has to be it all, man. Going down to the Bahamas. I love it. For a full week, staying down <laughs> at that resort and playing a ball game, winning that ball game. Man, nothing beats that. That was a lot of fun and uh, a lot of memories and stuff that I'll definitely carry with me for the rest of my life. But uh, absolutely, definitely the Bahamas Bowl. Did you guys end up winning that game? Yes, sir. We beat Toledo. Did you win a ring for it? Uh, yes, sir, we did. Let's go. I should have had you. Yeah, they were pretty nice. They are pretty nice. But um, – but no, going down to the Bahamas Bowl and being down there was a tremendous experience. But, you know, the whole thing, the first couple of days is like a parade. And then we're like, okay, well, we got to play a game here in a couple of days. Yeah. But uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And, it's not vacation, baby. It's not vacation. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But uh, staying in that casino, too, is pretty nice. So I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I love that. Um, what's some of the negative aspects of being a coach? The stuff that people don't really realize, like you said, um, so you have to sleep in the office sometimes. The amount of hours I know that go into it right. is insane. Yeah. Um, I would definitely say that that's definitely, that's definitely the top thing because um, it's going to pull away from your family at times. You know, there, there's obviously days in which I'm, I'm wishing I could be home sitting on the couch you know, watching the TV. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously, when it goes back to how much do you really love it? If you really love this, you know, people often say that coaching is a grind. You know, I don't really feel that it's a grind just because of how much I really love the sport of football. And I love coaching. I, you know, coaching is, excuse me, coaching is a service-based business, you know, so it's, it's much like teaching is. Um, so you got to be in it for the right reasons, but uh, the hours are pretty crazy at times. No, yeah. I, boy, I can check my coach. Like I'm watching film at 1 a.m. He's like, I'm up. Yeah. Like I've been doing the. He's like, I'll be watching this. I won't sleep. So that type sure. of stuff. Sure. Um, yeah, my, my, the circles under my eyes at times had circles under them, too. I had to watch those for crazy. What are some of the positives that have come out with um, COVID? So I know it's Ooh, positive. negative, but do you have more time now to um, be on social media, maybe? Maybe 100%. It's a better time yeah. for people to reach out? Sure, sure. No, I definitely said, you know, first positive is obviously being able to spend more time with my family, my uh, people I love the most, but. Uh, Aside from that, you know, in regards to football, you know, recruiting is definitely, you know, amped up a little bit. You know, the fact that we may not be able to get kids on campus, yes, but now we have more time to obviously dive into how good a kid really is, watch a lot of film of them. Then obviously, you know, growing my knowledge as a football coach as well, I think is huge. You know, a lot of what's come out of this in the coaching profession is a lot of guys are doing these virtual clinics now, like on Zoom stuff like this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're putting it out there and putting it on social media and it's free for everybody. And, uh, you get to watch and you get to hear from some big name guys. Like I was watching, I was watching Lincoln Riley the other day. I was watching Larry Fedora, Phil Longo, some of the, the biggest names in, in in college football, and that was that was that was huge. But uh, those are definitely a few of the positives that's come out of it for sure. I love that. I love that. Um, is there health care provided for your players? Like, what happens if you're already on the team? You're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, fifth year, whatever. What happens if you get hurt? Like, do you have to yeah. pay the medical bills? Like, what happens? No, a lot of it will be dependent upon what the injury and, and what it may or may not be because our, our, our staff here at, at Bryant, you know, does a tremendous job, but they, they take care of, you know, any minute injuries that someone may have, but it's a surgery type deal. It's obviously true. I'm not 100% sure how the, the payment of that kind of works itself out, but I, I, I would imagine that the university takes uh, care of most of it just because of the fact that, uh, you know, you're typically getting hurt on the university. If it's, I'd have to imagine if it's something that happens on the football field, 
we're probably going to pay for it. Now, if it's something that you did in your backyard, yeah, you know, I'm sure it's a little bit different. But uh, I'm not 100 percent sure to tell you the truth. No, I appreciate I appreciate that though. Um, so how does the, the fifth year work? Because I'm still confused about it. I played um, college football and I was about 45 years old when I retired, but um, or when I graduated. So how does that process work? as best as you can describe it, because I know that is confusing. I wrote my own letters to the NCAA. Somehow yeah. I, I lost a year and then I gained it back and I could have got another year. So if you can help yeah. me out with how does that yeah. work? Well, there's a couple of different ways that you can kind of get uh, an extra year. You know, the, the, the easiest one for people to really understand is the red shirt option, uh, which is when a kid's early on in his career, oftentimes when he's a freshman, um, you know, if he doesn't really play that year, he can red shirt that year and now that'll become his fifth year. Um, they actually just changed the rule to where now you can play four games as a freshman and still redshirt. Uh, to where it used to be where you can't play any games. You can practice and do that kind of stuff, but you couldn't play any game. Uh, but now because of the fact they just changed it, they can play in four games. And whether that's one snap or 60 snaps, um, doesn't really matter. If he played the snap in that ball game, that counts against his, uh, his number of games that he can possibly play in uh, before he redshirts. But there's other things like blue shirt, a gray shirt. Um, then there's a medical redshirt. Well, there's a bunch of different ones, but it's all kind of dependent upon it. It varies. Uh, but like the medical one, you know, we had a kid last year, a uh, senior captain, got hurt week two uh, in practice. And so he missed the entire season. So the NCAA basically had to apply for a waiver. They came back and said, oh, you missed a year, basically missed nine out of ten games. Um, here, yes, you have another year. Then we had another kid who played in six games and tried to medical as well because he missed out the last half of the season. And he didn't end up passing for that waiver. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, the NCAA is very, very confusing. There's no set. 100%. This yeah. is if you play this amount of time, you go. It's like if you transfer from D three to D one, D one to D three. Sure. You know. And then there's some rules too. I will say that they're pretty set on. That they'll say this is X, Y, or Z. It's black and white. But there's other times, uh, you know, the interpretation can be skewed a little bit, and it's really partly dependent upon uh, your compliance at your university too. Absolutely. Is do you know if there's like a certain age? Like if I'm 50 years old and I want to go back to college, can I, I don't know, if you know that. I, I would assume that as long as I mean, if you didn't play college ball, you still have eligibility. I mean, <laughs> good. you can do it. You can do it. But I know. I think it was. You might have to look it up. I want to say it was South Carolina State. I had a dude a couple of years ago that was. He was up there. He was playing college ball. And it was weird. He was older than most of the coaches. Like he was fully bald. Had like a little beard. And you'll have to look him up. You South Carolina know. State, I'm pretty sure. Are you sure he wasn't Eugene Allen from Hartwick College? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's dirty right there. Man. <laughs> no. All right, so um, um, what kind of things do you guys offer players who may be – players in general and then also players who may struggle academically? Like, do you guys have study hall or that type of thing? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you can go into yeah we, uh, we require our guys as freshmen when they come in to – I think it's eight or nine study hall hours per week. And they basically have to come in, and it, it is supervised. So we have two uh, academic supervisors, uh, Sue Presser and Zach Baker, do a tremendous job with those uh, young men. But they sit down with them basically, and if they need a tutor for whatever uh, class it may be, they can easily get that for them. Uh, but yeah, they basically until they get above that 3.0 um, as freshmen, um, they're going to be in study hall. So if they're below that 3.0 mark, they're going to be in study hall for a required number of hours um, each week. And like I said, our academic support here, Brian, is absolutely tremendous. But a lot of our older guys, too, to, to put a couple of bucks in their pocket will also be uh, tutors, too. So that. we'll do that kind of outside for uh, specific classes and kind of helps them out, put a couple bucks in their pocket for, uh, for some lunch money, too. Got you. Got you. Um, what's your opinion on players, since you said that you brought up a little, little bit of the money, a little bit of the money, what's your opinion on players getting paid to play college football or college sports in general? Yeah, I think it's it's a crazy time that we live in because, you know, these kids still get stipends uh, in which, okay, that, that also pays for not only what you're, you're going to school for, but groceries and stuff like that to live. Uh, if you're a full FBS uh, Division One scholarship athlete, you get a stipend too. Um, but I don't know. I'm kind of up in the air on it. Um, I think some of those big name guys that are actually bringing a lot of money to university, sure, I agree with them getting paid. But then, you know, Joe Schmo for no reason on the bench, you know, should he get paid? Probably not. But, I mean, I, it's – whatever happens, happens. But I don't know how the NCAA is going to regulate that. That That's going to be something crazy. Yeah, that is uh, – because um, I kind of saw an article on it. Something brief, who who knows if they're actually going to do it, but it's like your likeness, you know what I mean? So your jersey sales 
that's crazy when you think about college sports like yeah, yeah. now you have a million followers on instagram so you're gonna make more money and this guy like he's a better player maybe he brings in so many ticket sales for oregon but he's not that popular on instagram or right. you get someone that's super popular on instagram because they're the long shot you know or mm -hmm. the yes that's i don't know i don't know i just want who knows I, I have no idea like i said i don't know how instagram is going to regulate that stuff but, uh, but yeah those big schools that are getting named like i'm sure uh Ohio State with Justin Fields. You know, they're probably selling number one jerseys uh, at Ohio State, the Buckeyes. And, you know, it kind of alludes to, you know, Justin Fields. So should that guy probably get paid? Sure. Yeah. But uh, I, don't, I don't know how. Obviously, NCAA, NCAA is going to kind of split it up amongst a lot of different people. I'm sure they will, but I don't know how it's going to work out. Yeah, no, that's, that confuses me to think about. I just want to get your opinions on it. Um, sure. And I appreciate that. So I'm actually. Real quick, I actually assume that it'll probably be ends up ends up being like the NCAA 14, like the video game, mm -hmm. like where they paid every player that was in it like a certain dollar amount. I would assume that it actually ends up kind of being all the same lines, to tell the truth. See, I didn't even know that. I didn't know yeah. that the players in the game actually got whatever. That's that's so, yeah. Once once they shut that down, I don't know. You can look it up, but I think it was Greg McElroy that posted something not too long ago about. You know, he wished he had the game back. He's like, I'd give all the money that you guys gave me, and it really wasn't even that much that they gave him. Yeah, but uh, you're like, I, you know, take the money, bring the game back. I don't give a shit. Oh, that game is. I fun. think a lot of people are on the same lines. Yeah. Yeah, I still got my Xbox 360 for that reason only, just to play NCAA. Dude, I'm gonna have to bring that thing back. I gotta go find my Xbox 360. I don't know what I did with it. <laughs> I run the option play every single time. Oh, so repeated. So my dog's here. Repeated. The pups in the house. What up, pup? She's like, yeah. Oh, guest on the podcast. Yeah, she just wants to talk to you, honestly. Um, so how has being um, – go through your story real quick about your you transferring, you know what I mean, from wherever you started from, Stonehill, Hobart, Hartwick. Go through that process um, real quick for me. Sure. So I uh, when I graduated, I went off to Stonehill up in uh, Massachusetts. I was there for three semesters. Yeah, so I registered my freshman year there, uh, sophomore year, my first semester. I actually ended up playing. I started five games. I did relatively well. I didn't do great, but uh, I ended up deciding to to leave Stonehill for a variety of different reasons. I wanted to come closer to home, uh, so I went to Hobart. For people that don't know. Yeah, they're Division Two in the NE10 conference. But yeah, I, I I left there. I went to Hobart uh, in the Liberty League at the time. Um, I was there for probably another three semesters. Again, I played a little bit. I played sparingly. I played about probably four games. I want to say off the top of my head. And then uh, decided to to leave there again and went to Hartwick uh, for a variety of different reasons, too. Yep. And that's where the, the rest is history. You know that, buddy. But, uh, no, I love my time at Hartwick. Yeah, I, I met a lot of great people. And then the city or little town of Oneana has is, is got some great memories for me. That's for sure. Oneana is not real. That's what they say. It's not a real place. Really, yeah. Um, okay, so going off of that, playing D2 and D3, how has that helped and kind of um... – How's yeah? How's that helped with you coaching Division One? Sure, I think uh, you know, obviously at the Division Three level, yeah, you know, there's not really scholarships. <laughs> you know, you can get an academic package, but who are uh, you telling? Who are yeah. you telling? Yeah, and, yeah. But um, I think that really shows the guys who play Division Three. They love football. They're doing it for one reason because we want to continue playing the game. It's kind of along the same lines for Division Two and those JUCOs, you know the passion that you really have for it. But I do think that that's something that's definitely stuck with me throughout coaching as well, is that nobody's ever going to question my passion for the game because I, I love this thing so much. And you know, the amount of hours that I put into it um, has really set me apart, in my opinion, I guess, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Have you also learned um, – I'm not going to take any jabs because, you know, I would <clears> – <throat> have I you don't want to hear what not to do from certain coaches who um, – maybe take um, a lot of pride in the offense and then ignore the defense. Have you, have you learned what not to do from certain, certain coaches? I, I won't name any names, but um, certain coaches, certain, I mean, certain, certain, certain coach, certain coaches that do. <laughs> have you learned? Yes, I'm an offensive minded guy here. You're sitting here talking to a quarterback. Coach. That's yeah. your guy. That's, that's my guy too. Low key, low, low key. But, um, no, it doesn't have to just be – you can learn – you can say the good things and the bad things of whoever sure. plays a lot of schools. So they won't know who we're talking about. But certain coaches, have you learned what not to do? No, I mean, I think, you know, in my time as a – You said no. I'm not letting you – that's a cop-out answer. Hey, listen, listen, give me, give me a second. Let me explain myself here. Come on. 
but uh, no, I've had I've had plenty of coaches between the Division three and Division two level that I've been around, and you know those guys have gone off to some tremendous places and done some special things. But uh, you know, I learned a lot from them. They were the do's and the don'ts, and uh, you know, a lot of this too, especially at an early age for myself, was trial and error in a variety of different ways. Um, but yeah, learning from them was it was definitely showed me the ropes. But I can't speak poorly on, on anybody. Uh, no, of course not. not. Of course. As a player, but it, I mean, it's. And anything that you do, you learn what not to do. Even if oh, you, or you played or whatever under Nick Saban, who's the greatest college football coach, you learn some things that not to do, or I should have, I should have phrased it better. Um, some things that won't work for you that worked for them. A hundred and ten percent, right? I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think there's, you know, the coaches that I had, you know, I certainly kind of try to style my coaching uh, off of that as well. Um, but. Uh, you know, you know me. I'm reserved to begin with, yeah, so absolutely. I keep, I kind of keep that even keel with me as a college coach sometimes because, you know, again, it goes back to that relationship that you have with the kid. You know, you can really get on some of these kids at times, but uh, if you have that relationship, you can do that. But if you don't, you know, the kid's going to look at you funny like, mm, what's this coach telling me right now? I don't really trust what he's saying. But you know, that's one of the first things I try to do with these guys, you know, regardless of how talented they may be, is build a relationship with them. And I think all my guys here at Brian know that. You know, that I love them regardless of where they are on the depth chart. It doesn't really matter to me. You know, I, I treat the the bottom of the depth chart guy just like he's number one. That doesn't mean, mean nothing to me. I love that. All right, so I'm going to get deep on you a little bit. Oh, um, boy. We're going to dig deep in that that smart brain that you have. Um, so do you think it's important? I'll try to provide examples because I don't really know how to ask this question. Um, sure. So say you're super reserved in your coaching style, and obviously I'm not even almost to the level of coaching style you are. But me as a person, I'm a, you can do better. I'm a yell at you. I'm going to like do this. Do you think it's important to know who you are, which is kind of a safe answer. Like you got to know yourself, but um, how much can you vary? Because I know personally, at, when I was um, at Hartwick, like I'm a do as I do. Like, I'm not even going to hype you up. I'm not going to say, do this. I'm just follow my lead. And I also, um, now I learn from it. Like I have to kind of express myself. I should have gave like team meetings. I should have been like, you got to do this. And so um, to kind of connect it all together, um, you got to know yourself, but how much wiggle room is there to like, if you look up to Nick Saban or something and he's like a yeller, do you, do you kind of bridge the gap, like the gray area or do you remain true to yourself? Uh, for myself specifically, I would definitely say that I remain true to myself at the end of the day. Um, my coaching style, because the kids are going to know too. If you start acting like something that you're not, I think the kids understand and they're smart enough to know when you're being fake, right? And I think, you know, real recognizes real. I, I know that's an old saying, but uh, I think the kids recognize that as well. As well. And as, as long as you're kind of on the same page with them, you know, whether or not you're yelling at them, as long as you're being constructive, like I'm never going to attack a kid uh, personally. I'm always going to keep it, you know, real with you. I'm going to tell you what you need to do and what you not need to do. You know, if you're not being intentional on this day, I'm going to tell you, you know, you're, you're wasting my time. You're wasting everybody else's time, but I'm never going to attack you as a person. Absolutely. And I think that's important too. And that goes back to the relationship that you have with the kid. If you know the kid and what type of person that he is, you know how to push his buttons and kind of get him going at times and then kind of rear him back as well. A hundred percent. Do you what. watch the UFC at all? Are you into like MMA UFC? A little bit. It's not. It's not one of my first things that I'll, I'll pop on the TV when I sit down for for dinner or something. But, uh, but yeah, occasionally, especially with this COVID stuff, one of the first sports that came back was UFC. And that was one of the. the I was like, sports are on TV. I don't care what it is. I'm watching. Hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, do you know the story of the kid who? It was really recent in the news. Um, I'll just keep it brief, and if you don't know it, then I'll explain it. Uh, he was a fighter who quit in the middle of a fight. Did you hear that story? Mm, vaguely like he turned around and looked at the dude and then walked out of the freaking uh, ring no no no. that's oh i know what you're talking i saw that on um that was uh I think yeah. that was deontay wilder someone was fighting wilder right yeah some yeah so, yeah exactly um so in this case it was a ufc fighter who was in a fight he took it on short notice like the cards were stacked against him so sure. he's sitting on the bench he's not doing he's not winning the fight but he's not getting hurt and he's not getting killed either so he's sitting on the bench and um his coach is like, his coach is exactly what I would say. Like, you got this. Like, this is not the mind of a champion. Like, you got to, you got to want it. You got to go back out there. You got to, yeah. all this stuff. And the fighter, like, looks at him and he's like, I'm done. 
So as a coach, it's like he took a huge hit on Twitter and everything else because they're like, you're not out there fighting. Like, and then when I say like my piece, I'm like, I would have been the same coach because that coach has worked with this guy. Um, maybe this guy is a guy who's like, um, you know, when you've given your absolute best and you're exhausted and you have no mm-hmm. more and you're like, you take a knee, you're sweating. And then the coach is like, passion changes everything. This coach is like, you're going to quit. Like, what would your parents think? And then you get up and do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, what's your like opinions on that? If you can give an opinion, if I made any sense. Kind of been sure. No, I'm kind of following along with you, but I do definitely think that, you know. Knowing your players, right? I, it, 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 that's what exactly I was going to say. It goes back to, you know, the type of kids that we recruit here at Bryant. I don't, I don't want a kid that ever is going to quit doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, not too long ago, I think it was Dan Mullen was standing up in a press conference. He's talking about his players, and he's like, you know, I want competitive kids. That doesn't matter what we do. You want to thumb wrestle with me? I'm going to kick your ass. That's right? And that's kind of that's the same mentality that, you know, I try to look for within within kids that we recruit. And I think that that's something that we have to do as a staff that we have to vet guys uh, coming into Brown University. And I think that's really really important. I think, you know, if a kid's got any quit in them, why is he doing it to begin with? Why put in all those hours of training? To, to go over to a UFC fight and then just bail at the last moment. It just doesn't, thousand percent. doesn't make sense to me. I completely agree with that. Um, I was getting some heat from some people because they were like, bro, like if you're in there and you quit, like that's your decision. And I'm like, it's my job as a coach, if I'm this UFC trainer, to motivate you. And I'm, I guarantee he's the kid, like obviously works hard, but he's the kid. Um, we've all been there. I've been there in workouts a million times where I'm just like, like no, I'm especially when I'm by myself. If I'm with people, I'm gonna fake it. I'm gonna fake it so I make it. When I'm when you're by yourself and you're working out and you're just dead, like you have no more in you. And a coach comes over and he's like, "That's it. That's all you have to offer." I'm the type. I'm gonna be like, "Nah, I got more." And I guarantee he's that type of person. So when he quit, or he even mentioned it that he wanted to quit, the coach is like, "Bro, this is not you." You know what I mean? So yeah. I, know I, I took a lot of. I took a lot of backlash for that. Sure. Well, I think it's also, you know, part of our responsibility as a coach is to build these kids' self-confidence in themselves. You know, if I have a kid who goes out there and he's questioning his abilities, I don't think he's going to do very well regardless. Uh, so if a kid has pretty high self-confidence, uh, I think it's really important as well. What, what are your thoughts on um, – because I know personally when I went to – I won't name the school, but the first school that I went to, the coach was um, – he's going to build you down. He's going to um, – just like the army or the military, they break you down to build you back up. Um, yeah. First of my opinion, I'll give you my opinion on it. So when I went there, I'm not a super cocky, confident kid. Like every time I play football or do anything, I'm like, if I'm playing football, I think the cornerback that I'm going against is the greatest cornerback of all times, you know? So I'm like, in my head, it just works for me where I'm like, he could stop me. Like he could embarrass me. So that's the kind of thing I go. And then you get people that are super confident, super cocky, um, or just confident, ignore the cockiness, which is, it works for them. You want someone super confident, especially in sports. Um, sure. So those people, I – and personally, you can bring those people down. There's, like, a course, a method in knowing who you're working with. But with a guy like me, the coach came in to break me down, and then I'm like – it wasn't in a motivational way. It was kind of like, you're going to come here as a freshman. You're not going to play. And I'm like, <laughs> you can't tell me that because in my mind, I'm like, that will motivate me to want to go hard. But then literally if I go out there and I'm bawling out, doing all the right things, and then he's literally like, you're not going to play. What are your opinions on that? And then just the philosophy of breaking someone down to build them up in general or how you go about doing it. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is, you know, I would have at least appreciate the kid or the coach being real with you. Right. And he's not going to lie to you. He's not BSing you. Yeah. Going off that right off real quick. Cause, um, I know it's big when coaches blow smoke. Um, it, we'll, we'll get back to the question that I asked, because this is a way better question. This is a way better sure. question. Sure. So how much um, have you ever or have you heard of a coach, like factually, because I've heard the rumors, have you ever told the kid he's going to come in here and play or he's going to come in here and start? I personally would never say that to a kid. I'll say, hey, you can come in, you can compete. Absolutely. You know, we've played freshman in the past at Bryant. I, we have no issue doing that. If you're the best player on the field, 100% go out there and do it. Um, but at the same time, I would never, ever promise a kid before he gets – before he steps foot uh, on campus to, to say, hey, you're going to be the starter when you get here. I, I think that's you're, – you're setting yourself up for a recipe for, for failure because at a certain point in time, you're going to do that to a bunch of different kids, and then they get there, and then, well, well why am I not playing, coach? Yeah. Okay, and that's where the transfer portal comes into play, and there's a bunch of kids in the portal. 
And I think that's really important to to tell the kid, hey, yeah, you can come here, you can compete, right? But we have other guys on the roster too that are pretty good. Yeah, they were recruited, they're on scholarship for a reason, right? And that, that also shows, okay, how competitive the kid truly is and where is his self-confidence, right? If that kid says, okay, I'm coming in, I know I'm going to compete, and I got the highest self-confidence in myself, great. That's exactly what we're looking for to begin with. Oh, absolutely. I love that. All right, now so now we can go back to um, – so what are your thoughts on um, breaking someone down to build them back up? That kind of philosophy where they come in. Yeah. High and high. I think it definitely, again, it goes back to the same thing, knowing who you're trying to talk to and the type of athlete and what he needs best at that point in time. If he needs to be broken down a little bit to, to build him back up, that's exactly what I think you need to do. But it's not a cookie cutter thing that you can attribute to every single student athlete. It doesn't work like that. You know, each one of them are different. and They've been all brought up in different ways. So that's really important to understand as well. And that, you know, when you need to break a kid down, typically it's when his head's too big. He's thinking too much of himself. Okay, let's come back down. Well, let's, let's get back down here, buddy. Let's, all right. But um, to kind of keep him on, again, especially at the quarterback position for myself, at least, I want them to be even keel. You know, you got to ride the highs and the lows at sometimes, right? It's not always going to be, it's not, it's not one straight line. It's, it's ups and downs. Absolutely. A million, million, bajillion, bajillion, bajillion. Oh, I got bars. Percent. <laughs> But um, so you're gonna put that in the intro now. <laughs> a million bajillion bajillion. Um, so what's what's the future? Let's say COVID kind of messes up this question. But what's the yeah. future for you guys if COVID wasn't there for right now? And then what's in the what's your dream life for Tall Tom? <laughs> um, I'll start off with the first one. You know, obviously our, our season got postponed. You know, they're going to reconvene as a, as a committee for the NEC on October 1st to kind of decide what we're doing with the season. I would imagine, to tell you the truth, that it probably gets postponed to the spring like a lot of teams are doing across the country right now. And then I think a lot of people are kind of seeing where this COVID deal plays out. What's the, how far can we really progress as a country? You know, if, if there comes out with a vaccine, you know, great. You know, maybe we can play in, in a couple months. But who knows what, really what's going to happen. It's, it's a situation in which, you know, I don't have any background dealing with pandemics. I don't know very many people that do, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but it is, it's something crazy. But um, yeah. And then for myself, dreams. Dream life. Dream crazy. The perfect world. If, if it's coaching, if Bill Belichick said, you know what? I don't want to be a head coach anymore. I just want to um, give this business over. The, I, want the, I want the craziest and I don't, I don't want anything less. I, don't, I won't accept. I want to be the head coach. I want the craziest dream you have. And then how sure. are you going to, how are you going to accomplish that crazy dream? Sure. Oh man. Well, I mean, the first, first thing that pops in my head is obviously, you know, in some capacity, I want to coach for the Buffalo Bills. I mean, that was my, my dream growing up to play for the Bills. Now, obviously, you know, being from an hour from Buffalo, I want to get back to that city and you know, hopefully Sean McDermott, uh, I don't, I'm not saying if Sean McDermott ever leaves. I hope he stays there forever. Cause I think he's a tremendous ball coach, but, uh, Yes, in some capacity, be involved with them and in some regard. But, uh, you know, within the next five years, I, I would say, you know, one of my goals is to also become an offensive coordinator here pretty soon. But uh, who knows when that's going to work itself out. But, you know, one of the things I always say, too, is, uh, you know, be where your feet are. You know, I don't want to be too much worried about where's the next thing, what's the next step. What, Everything will work itself out 100%. 100%. I love right? that. And that goes to, you know, as long as I'm putting my, my full abilities into what I'm doing right now, being here and now and present. Um, I think the rest will take care of itself. And at the end of the day, if you don't make it to the Bills, yeah, you know, I think I'll still have a great story when I'm, when my head hits the pillow, that's for sure. Oh, 100 percent A thousand percent. Um, so when you make it to the Bills, you know, let's say it's five years, I'll be about yeah, you might have a couple of gray hairs, but <laughs> I'll be about thirty one. You know, I was a late bloomer. That's what I tell everyone. I'm a, I'm not 20, I'm not twenty six. I was a late bloomer. I was a kid who was five eight until his junior year, you know, so I'm just I'm just I'm just getting there. Everyone's slowing down. We're picking back up. You feel me? I don't have no arthritis yet. Feeling good. I don't well, know about you. You're hey, you got to get on the TB12 method. He's playing until he's, what, 50? That's what he says he wants to do? I don't want that method. I don't want that method. Look at that man. Okay, I think he's just – because he's not a freak athlete, so his method must be doing well, something great. We him. actually had this conversation the other day. Is Tom Brady an athlete, or is he just, like, an overrated punter? Like, he's, he's one of the most skilled freaking players ever, but he's not a great athlete. No, man. no. I want the the DK. I want the DK Julio Jones. That's that's the type of no. Um, oh, those dudes are freaks. Freaks. Uh, so, 
where can everyone get in contact with you? Um, what's your Twitter handle, Twitter name? Um, sure. Want to release your Instagram or Facebook? You can, but most importantly, Twitter. Yeah, Twitter definitely the number one thing. My at is uh, Coach Sadesky. So it's Coach and then S Y D E S K I. I know that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me on there. But uh, Twitter is a big one, especially in the college football world right now where recruiting is basically. That's it. It's Twitter. I love Everybody's it. got their huddle link and their pinned tweet and whatnot and all that nonsense. But uh, that's the best thing for me for sure. I appreciate you, my boy. And I know it sounds like I'm wrapping it up, but I'm not wrapping it up. I just want to get that out there so I don't forget. Um, I want to dig deep into you, but I don't want to. I don't want you to release. Do your thing, dog, and then we'll 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 vet it on the way back. Yeah. We'll say, hey, you should probably piece that, take that out of there. No, hundred percent. I can do that. I can do that. Um, why did you agree to be on this podcast? And don't just say um, it's free marketing and I love you so much. But um, why did you agree to be on this podcast? Because I mean, the marketing thing never came to mind to tell you the truth. I mean, the first thing was. My dog is doing a podcast. He wants me to have him to come on. I'm going to do that in a heartbeat. I mean, to be able to tell my story and, you know, you giving uh, myself and a variety of other people a platform to get out there, I think is huge. But uh, listen, I mean, to catch up with one of my boys, I think is huge. Why, why would I not do that? How I could I say that? I love it. All right. So that, that question is because I never let – this is going to be my thing. I'll never let no, – they never hear it for the people that are listening. My guests never hear my introduction to them until it's already recorded. So there's no, that's, that's my thing. So when you hear it, it's weird because I'm by myself in a room telling it. <laughs> so I try not to get too emotional. But sure. uh, yeah, so I love, love that. Absolutely love it. Thousand million kajillion percent. All right, so. All right, my boy. So I really wanted to thank you for being a part of the podcast. Um, I know you won't hear the introduction. So I kind of wanted to give you just a little, little taste of it. So what Passion Changes Everything really represents is all of the people that have been a super inspirational factor in my life. So I wanted to let you know that you really inspired me to be a better person, to be a nicer person, not to knock everybody out when I fight, not to be so emotional and angry. You really inspired me and you've really changed my life and made me a better person. And I'm not just saying that to blow smoke because um, I really, truly mean it. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, it was my pleasure. I, I appreciate you having me on. You know, uh, you and I go way back, but I can definitely say for a fact that uh, my time and hard work would have been drastically different than you if you and I had not connected, that's for sure. But uh, I always appreciate you. And uh, like I said, one of these days, once this COVID deal slows down, hopefully we can get together for sure. Oh, let's go. Um. Oh, I, I thought of another question, if you don't mind. I'm here. I love it. So let's say I had a player that that I wanted to send you or that a coach wanted to send you, not just the player themselves. What is your opinion on someone else sending a player? I know it's going to be more coming from a coach, but if it's someone that um, someone like me will go with, because I'm sure. not going to send you anybody just because he's my boy. Cause you know, how yeah. I am. Like, no, he's, he's, that kid's trash. I'm going to be blatant with you. Um, sure. so how do you feel about other people sending you players? Cause that can yeah, get really annoying. Know. But, no, yeah. yes and no. It depends kind of uh, who, who are they to you, you know, what do they mean to you. But at the same time, uh, I have no issue with, with guys doing that as long as, you know, they do it the right way. And like you said, if it's some guy who's just your buddy and you're trying to get him to a different college for whatever reason, you want, you want him to play the D1 dream, um, you know, that's different. But if the kid's actually, you know, worth anything, you know, if, if you think he has the ability, I, I'd love to see him. And if not, even if you say, hey, you know, I don't know who to contact, you know, whoever it may be, if this kid, maybe not a division one player, but, you know, you think he's division three, you know, I, I'd love to get you in contact with somebody else. I you know I think that's, that's the number one thing for sure. I love that. I absolutely love that. All right. One more time. Where can everyone find you on Twitter? Twitter. My at is Coach Sadesky. So it's Coach S-Y-D-E-S-K-I. All right. Thank you so much, my boy. I really absolutely. We'll have to do this again sometime. All right. Absolutely. Once I get the studio set up, oh, you just wait. You just wait. Thank you. Looking forward to it.